Hello, I'm Gimlet. I'm currently located on land that may be the land of one of your goats. Would you find a city where I'm located? I can help you out with three clues. Firstly, despite its Spanish name reminiscent of paradise, this city has never been founded by any conquistador, and actually, its founder still remains unknown. Nicknamed the Pacific Pearl, it comes from its mythical port that welcomes sailors from all over the world and which still serves today. Then, this town holds a famous prison, built in 1844 and now converted into a cultural park. Among others, it had housed Emile Dubois, considered by the locals as the French Robin Hood because his crimes were mainly committed against rich bourgeois. Finally, due to its steep landscape, this metropolis will put your stamina to the test as you climb its serious hills. But the powerful view gives a special look to one of the wealthiest countries in America and its color houses. Did you find out? Well done, but are you sure? If yes, you are real wanderings. For those of you who don't have it, you still have somewhere to go. Whatever it be, let's go together exploring. Wanderings, let's hit the road. The answer to this enigma is Valparaiso or Ali Mapu, the name given by the Changos indigenous. In Mapuche, Ali means dry, hot, burnt, while Mapu can be translated by land. They name it like so because of the clayey color of its hills. If we look at this elongated country, Valparaiso is located more or less center west near the coast. We suppose that 300,000 inhabitants live in it. I said suppose because we don't really know. Could be more due to people who are unregistered or just build houses on their own. Yes, I know, I couldn't build a house from scratch myself. You have all my respect, Chileans. The jewel of the Pacific, as they also name the city, yes, it has few names, is divided in two, between cerros and plan, meaning one upper part where 90% of the people live and one lower part where you do everything else, where you work, you shop, you dance, eat, yawn, I think you get my point. Valparaiso is full of colors and its multicultural and brilliant past as a mythical port allowed him to be declared World Heritage by the UNESCO in some part of the city in 2003. There's a lot to talk about, starting with dogs, for instance. The estimation of dogs in here are 40,000, huge number. As abandoned as they look, many people feed them every day and vaccinate them. They're also part of Valpo identity and charm if you like dogs, that to say. Valparaiso shares its expanded bay with Viña del Mar, Reñaca and Cancan. At first, I saw Viña del Mar and Valparaiso like two towns that came out from a sci-fi movie. In my mind, Valparaiso was where people from low social class settle and Viña del Mar where people from high incomes and comfortable jobs stay. Of course, it's more complicated than that. Nothing is too complicated once you detail it and explain it passionately. Yes, folks, we are entering into the history section where we'll talk about how and why Valparaiso became what it is today with passion and fruit. Maybe just passion, and we'll keep the fruity, fruity, fruit for later. Opening. History. History. Section. history section. Valparaiso started off with Spanish conquistador who came in hoping to satisfy the lust of gold during the Age of Discovery. Juan de Saavedra, following order of Diego de Almagro, landed in Valparaiso in 1536 with his boat from Peru. Disappointed by the very little gold they found, Juan decided to travel back to Peru. The next trip was five years later. 
Pedro de Valdivia, who founded Santiago in 1541, named Valparaiso port of capital of Chile in 1544. Funny part is, the port capital was never founded by the Spanish or anyone else. City plans, neighborhood limits, nothing. That explains why streets, houses, and how the city is made is, and remains, peculiar. The port grew little by little and attracted in the 19th century with the independence of Chile, countries from all over the world, mainly Europeans from Great Britain, Germany, France, and Italy. The city was the essential stopover to California for ships from Europe to United States that endured the hard Cape Horn. The Golden Age of Valparaiso stopped when they opened the Panama Canal in 1914. True, why took all the risk down south with extreme climate when you can just cross the continent at its center? Then, years after years, Valparaiso went down in ranking as most important port in Chile. Nowadays, it is in third position behind San Antonio and Antofagasta. It is maintaining a good rank thanks to its exploitation of copper, fruits, salmon and iodine. From here, to understand why Valparaiso and Chile are in crisis, we need to go back in time, in 1973. At this very moment, the US didn't want to deal with another country like Cuba. Salvador Allende was a socialist elected by the Chileans in 1970. So the United States mostly helped to make what you are about to see happen. Augusto Pinochet and his men founded the first neoliberalist country. Basically, this means consuming excessively, preferring a free market capitalism that is away from government spending, regulation and public ownership. What does that have to do with today's protests, you might ask? Well, a lot. At first, the current constitution was written in 1980. Meanwhile, of all these injustices, horrors during the dictatorship. Fortunately, not so long ago was voted and approved the change of the constitution, which is really a big deal for Chile. Even though it might take a while to change, there is hope. Secondly, cost of life kept increasing over the years, whereas incomes did not, which made Chile today the most expensive country in South America with a lot of inequalities. Medical cares, retirement plans, educations are practically all a business and highly unaffordable. So to fight this, you ask for a credit, to the point to buy your own daily food in grocery stores with installments. Chile's situation, as I mentioned, is not desperate. People fought and are still fighting today for justice in order to change history once again. Now that you know more about Valparaiso's history and the situation of the country, let's jump into what I like the most in Valparaiso. Let's begin with the two most touristy cerros or quarter of them all, Alegre and Concepcion Hills. It is here on these two hills that Europeans constructed their houses in the 19th century. Italians, French, Germans, Croatians, and English lived up in the city, not too far from the port, but far enough to avoid unpleasant smells and workers. Proof are these beautiful English houses with their gardens, high ceiling, sash windows, and that metal sheeting, here to protect the house from rain and salt. I have to show you two palaces nearby which drive me crazy in a Paseo Yugoslavo. First of them, Palacio Astoreca. It was constructed by a Croatian for an English woman. It could give you ideas for your girlfriend next time. 
This is her Victorian palace which was abandoned for a long time and in 2012 it was restored and changed into a luxurious hotel. 23 rooms, including 7 suites, spa, old library, terrace, you get it, a 5 star hotel definitely creditable. Second palace is the Palacio Barburiza. Eclectic style, constructed in 1916 by two Italians for an Italian family. They probably had two Italian dogs as well. In 1925, it belonged to Mr. Barburiza, one of the richest men in Chile who lived in Valparaiso. It built its fortune thanks to South Peter, which was abandoned in Chile. It helped make powder and fertilizer. Later on, he gave his personal collection to the city of Valparaiso. And today, this is the Museum of Art. You visit it for its paintings, but also and mostly to visit this beautiful palace lost in time and space. Before we leave these two cerros, I want you to see two churches, and not just any churches, protestant ones. The Anglican is special because it was the first non-Catholic church built in Chile. So that shows the huge tolerance in Valparaiso at the time, letting in 1857 English believers build this. They had to make concessions though, no tower and no main entrance. That explains why the only way to come in is from the back or on the sides. The Lutheran, for her part, is the first protestant church in all South America to own a bell tower. Inside of these two churches, you can find two organs given by the Queen Victoria herself. They are playing them every Sunday. We continue with this protestant catholic division in the most quieter place on earth, the cemetery. There are four in total in the city. Three of them are located in the same place into the hill pantheon. Number two, dissidents, and number one. Originally just two, one for catholics and one for protestants. Rich families are buried there, like Barburiza. Remember the Italian man who owned one of the palace? The Edwards family, who created Chile First Bank, Roche Mont, former president of Chile, or Rosé Francisco Vergara, founder of Vignal del Mar. The least that we could say is how impressive the graves are. All of the soils, because only rich men were capable once they die, to still float above the society. The other cemetery is the one we are interested in, the cemetery number three. I know, I know, I wouldn't have called it like that, but whatever. It was built in 1887, mainly because of the poorest families who couldn't afford to be buried in other places. So tombs are in the ground, but with particularities. In one area, you'll have the one gone too soon. For them, they used wooden materials, colors, toys or objects they have loved, cherished when they lived. The other areas are reserved to entire families who are a bit stacked together, making me wonder how they reached the top of it. Numbered blocks and endless alleys from here is what you will see. Do you see all this? This is the tomb of Émile Dubois, a Frenchman considered today by the inhabitants as the Chilean Robin Hood. Wrongly, because he did steal to the rich, but he never gave it to the poor. He was just a robber and a serial killer. However, it is quite funny that his name was glorified, mystified, until he became a hero in our days. A proof that time can really turn something obscure and black to real legends full of hopes. In addition to having a beautiful cemetery, the sunset reflecting on the bay offers a dazzling show you couldn't refuse.
let's change hills to go to the Cerro Bella Vista. Literally means nice view. Does he really stand up for his name? Well, you are the judge, but I will say yes. Sobre el manto de la noche está la luna chispeando. Así brilla fulgurando para establecer un fuero. Libertad para los negros, cadenas para el negro. This is the third most visited hill after Concepcion and Alegre. It is starting to grow thanks to its attractions like the house of Pablo Neruda, the famous poet. Mori Theater, right next to it. The Organological Museum, La Villa España, and the Open Air Museum, the one we are interested in. Dated from 1991-1992, it was the first time that artists, who usually painting on canvas or inside of a workshop, have been using their brushes outdoors on walls. Not so easy to find without a map, there are 20 paintings to look at, all numbered and credited. We cannot call them street art because they were done before all the hip-hop movement from the US and do not look like any other paintings you can see in Valparaiso. Some are disturbing paintings, others hard to understand and others, well, uh, I'll let you make your own judgment of all these paintings. But my favorite one is this one, simple but colorful and efficient. Mountains, the moon and the sun representing up of the mural and the other part down is more unrealistic. I see parts of monsters or french fries, the red one could be ketchup and the yellow one mustard, or french monsters with a mix of sauce. What do you think? Maybe I just want to eat something, I'm starving! At the end of this so-called street art, you can see a funicular. We didn't talk about them yet, but they are part of the city as much as an English breakfast with its bacon. Oh yeah. Yes, I really need to eat something. Give me something to eat. Honestly, one couldn't exist without the other. Meaning this city really need them to survive all these stairs. Anyway, this one, the Holy Spirit, was the last one to be restored in 2019. And when Chileans restored, they really do it. They take all off except the wooden structure and re-put it back to its original position. 13 are functioning at the time we speak, but more are to come. Originally, they were up to 30, all built between 1883 and 1914. But time, sometimes, and most of the time actually, doesn't do good. Hopefully in the future, there will be more and more for tourists and especially inhabitants to be able to climb these endless hills. As you probably already guessed, Valparaiso is a street art capital. Artists can express their art freely and use the city as a playground. How did it become like it? Well, for two things. One thing is that it could never be easier to paint on a house or a building than in Valpo. All you need is to ask the owner. If he agrees, then you can paint, just like that. Second thing, with all this variety of houses, up and down the streets, colors, possibilities are infinite. That's why artists globally come here, because their projects, ideas they might have in mind but couldn't fulfill in other cities, for instance, it can become real here. I really love four street art made by an uncular distinto, a Chilean couple who live in Valparaiso and often paint that men and women will kiss each other. They made more than four, but four of them represent the four seasons. Spring is the biggest ever done by them and actually the largest of all the city. 50 meters high on 50 meters wide are its size. Impressive by its dimension, but also it took them only a month to paint it. The other three are also worth to see, although a bit smaller. And for all the wine I miss, 
Here is a mix of many of them you could meet. I do hope you enjoyed this personal mix of mine. To gently end our journey in Valparaiso, I wanted to take you to a spot which holds a particular place in citizens' heart. A lot happened here that wasn't very pleasant for anyone. Yes, this place was a prison. It incarcerated criminals that deserved it, as well as young people with powerful ideas, among others who didn't ask anything during the dictatorship of Augusto Pinochet. This prison remained in service for a long time where conditions at the end of the 20th century were miserable. But thanks to the enthusiasm of the people who gathered here with families and friends, this prison was transformed into a cultural park in 2012. Oscar Niemeyer, a futurist Brazilian architect, was at first related to the restoration of the project. However, the city rejected his concept art, saying that this looked too futuristic to be in the middle of a town like Valparaiso. I personally think what they did is quite nice, but what they could have done with him, who always comes up with ideas that stand out, have a catchy look, could have been brilliant. In both cases, today, most of the activities they organize here are rather free or ask for a small contribution, which gives a cultural access to anyone who is willing to. At its center, you can observe what was the worst cell during its prison time, or a building where they stocked powder to use when the city got attacked by pirates a couple of centuries ago. In the end, the Excarcel is a kind and peaceful place where anyone can come to free his or her spirit and just breathe and wonder. This is the time we say our goodbye. I hope you like me wonder. If yes, thumb up. If you did not, well, you have to send videos of you swimming in one of your neighborhood's pool. I do to all of you an alpaca kiss with that spinning a bunch of wanderings. And here's the challenge as usual, find the atypical place where I am right now. And now it is your time to share and wonder. Buenos chiquillos, chela, chacabuco, chayane, ciao.